So again, uh, as Chris, I think, was alluding to, I, uh, I'm going to be doing equations without apologies. If that's not your cup of tea, this might be a great moment to sort of nip, nip off to the pub. I won't be offended. Uh, also, if, as I said, I'm trying to sort of strike the balance between some historical one and sort of very fairly basic models and kind of ramp up from there into some more complicated stuff. If you're into the really complicated stuff, you'll probably also want to nip off to the pub and I won't be offended, but you might be interested in my talk on Friday. Uh, so, sort of having said that, uh, I guess enough of you have stuck around that I don't get to nip off to the pub. So, I'm going to sort of run through and this will make sense as I go through. So, I'll start with a couple introductory comments and then move on to Fisher's log series, which is going to be sort of the motivating example of almost everything that I do in the next hour and a half, in which I try and cram an entire course in stochastic analysis into 90 minutes. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is sort of go from a Fisher's model to sort of trying to build some toy phenomenology, uh, sort of mechanistic models that might motivate what Fisher did. And then, assuming that I have time left, which I'm not planning on, I'll get to Preston's log normal when the gloves come off, and I'm just going to sort of start using whatever I see fit in terms of mathematics. Uh, but again, probably won't even get there. Uh, and you'll notice there's no conclusion here, so just draw your own conclusions from what I've said. So let me start off with an introduction. I always love putting this quote up as the first thing whenever I talk about a mathematical problem. It goes right back to The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, the famous entangled bank quote. When we look at the plants and bushes clothing an entangled bank, we are tempted to attribute their proportional numbers and kinds to what we call chance. But how false a view of things this is? Well, I'm a probability theorist and a statistician. So um, if that's Darwin's orthodox, I'm very much a heretic. And I think the view that a probabilist would take to a lot of nature is, in fact, there are lots and lots of random processes always at work in biological systems, right? I mean, uh, demographic stochasticity, which I'm going to keep talking about, which is that, you know, it, that we're not all identical, right? There's always individual variation. We don't, sort of, we don't all suddenly, you know, pop, everyone has birth all at once, and we wait, you know, six months, pop, everyone dies at once. There's individual variation in lifespan, in birth events and death events. And usually we think of that as being independent. That's kind of, that's you doing you. Then we lump a lot of what's left into what we call environmental stochasticity. So imagine like in a sort of, it's a hot summer, it's a cold winter, it's a rainy year. These sort of chance events in the environment that affect all individuals equally also are random and have effects on population dynamics. And so this is a big and important part of the, of the question. There's dispersal. I mean, if you think about the Galapagos Islands, you know, the whole, you know, where Darwin went. I mean, Darwin's saying, well, there's no chance, that's nonsense. But of course, what happened in the Galapagos Islands? But finches arrived there kind of by chance and then started getting out there and multiplying and, and diversifying. As Chris mentioned, he and I like to work, started working on the population genetics. I mean, mutations happen at random. You're an unlucky one day, you get hit, zapped by a bit of, you know, I guess a folk, you know, there's some kind of weird high intensity gamma ray that hits you, bang, your gametes are now changed, you're carrying a mutation, a random event. And finally, unless you've got like the most perfect experimental system ever, you're not observing everything. You're observing a random subsample of what's actually happening. And especially when you start doing field ecology, you're not even having the slightest chance of observing anything, right? You're seeing a very small random sample of a very big world. Uh, so this randomness is in fact everywhere and omnipresent when we talk about community ecology. And one last bit of sort of introductory comments is that you know, I've been using my sort of religious imagery of, of orthodoxy and her heresy. This is my particular creed and it comes out of another quote which I like to always throw out, which is, you know, sort of, I guess the, one of those great apocryphal ones where Enrico, uh, Freeman Dyson said, Enrico Fermi said that, uh, John von Neumann said, with four parameters I can fit an elephant, and with five I can make him wiggle his trunk. And why I put this quote up is because there is a lot of modeling where you have hundreds of model uh, of parameters and a really super complicated model. And guess what? You can predict anything you like whatsoever with a sufficiently complicated model. You can fit your data perfectly well, and get exactly zero insight. 
it's not going to tell you what's going to happen next because you could have just fit anything, right? I mean, uh, if you think about it, if you're fitting curve, you know, fitting a curve, you know, sort of, if I allow myself enough degrees of freedom, I can fit every point on that curve, but it doesn't tell me anything, right? So I really, really believe in simple models, toy models. If I have more than three parameters, I start to worry because I'm not here to draw you an elephant, certainly not to make its trunk wiggle. The other thing I'll sort of say about my own sort of personal idiosyncratic view is I like individual based models. And the reason I like individual based models is because they keep it clear and they keep it understandable. I mean, we always talk about, you know, sort of genic selection, right? I mean, that's sort of the common idea we talk about. But genes don't go off, meet at bars, and reproduce amongst themselves. Genes sit in individuals. Individuals are the ones who reproduce. Individuals are the things we can measure. Individuals are the things we can observe. And I can tell you as a reviewer of a lot of papers on stochastic models is people produce a lot of absolute nonsense modeling when they forget that biology is fundamentally about individuals. And we want to think about other models as being emergent phenomenon from individual based models. That's kind of my personal like that's my little zealotry there. Other people won't agree, but again, I'm the one up here talking so I get to sort of tell you my worldview. Oh yeah, sorry. One last thing here is what I'm going to do here is I want to talk about some of these stochastic modeling techniques, some of these types of stochasticity in it's kind of like model zero for community ecology. And that's the question of relative species abundance. And this, so, you know, again, you probably came here looking for a bunch of sophisticated microbial ecology. I'm giving you like ecology 101 here, just species diversity. One of the fun, fundamental questions, what we've been doing pretty much since the beginning of biology, is we go out in the field and we sort of say, well, how many species are there? Like, you know, taxonomy, that's where we started from. How abundant are they? How evenly distributed are they? You know, I would argue sort of like this is the core question of community ecology, whether you're talking about microbes, whether you're talking about birds, whether you're talking about elephants. And it's also one of the very first models in community ecology came right here. And I'm showing right here is the standard Elephant's abundance plot, number of species, number of individuals, and we've got this sort of nice shape here. And for probably fairly about the last hundred years, give or take, people have come up with various theories to try and explain this shape. I'm going to talk about the, one of the very first ones. One of the things, sort of actually, before I jump into the math, please, please, please stop and ask questions. Uh, I really, really like interactive. I basically, I can, I can go here and babble on at great length for the rest of, you know, for, for basically from here until the end of the day. But as the other thing, so there's no dumb questions, only dumb explanations, or maybe dumb instructors. So really, if anything is just not clear, just just throw up a hand, or if, if you just have something to say, like you know, do you have a better way of doing it? Throw up a hand, you know, just shout it out. Okay, so just like stop me when you want, because I want to keep this as much as possible informal. So, what I want to talk about again is that trying to predict that curve that I just showed you. And what I want to talk about really is the very first model of that. Well, actually, I lied since I wrote this. I actually found that there was an earlier model, but it was completely phenomenological, but I want mechanisms. So this is going to be my mechanistic, sort of mecha first mechanistic model. So Corbett was a field ecologist. He went about in the Malay Islands sampling butterflies. And he collected exactly the kind of plot data that I just showed you, this idea of how many, you know, sort of how many species of butterfly, how many representatives of each species was there. Williams did the same thing, only he did it at a field station. He was working with light traps and basically had similar counts just right here in the UK of the number of species of butterfly and moths that he collected in his traps in the field site. And they saw this pattern, this pattern that I showed you in the previous slide. And they went to R.A. Fisher, who is, other than some rather strange views on eugenics, is generally considered to be one of the great minds in population genetics, and certainly one of the founders of statistics. You know, we've all heard about Fisher tests, Fisher complexity. Like, R.A. Fisher basically is, is the father of modern statistics. And I think these guys must have been really bold because I can't imagine myself going up to like the most famous living statistician and saying, hi, I've got some data, can you explain this for me? Uh, but that's exactly what they did, more or less. And Fisher was actually quite happy to take it up. 
and they ended up writing this nice little three-part paper. It's like each of them sort of wrote a few pages in 1943. So what they did is Fisher wanted to sort of account for two things. Again, these randoms that I talked about. I talked about demographic stochasticity, environmental stochasticity. That's leading to randomness in the number of individuals of a species there are, right? That, these two factors here. And of course, they're sampling, right? So they're not actually seeing every butterfly in the Malay Islands. So there's an element of randoms from the sampling. And so Fisher, being sort of like this great, greatly insightful person that he was, immediately went to write these two questions. He wanted to have a stochastic model for the population and a stochastic model for the sampling, and sort of asked, well, would that, would that be enough between these two things to predict the curve that I just showed you? So the first thing that Fisher did is that he said, OK, I want a model for species abundance. What I want to do is, is sort of create a random model that sort of says that if you go out and you pick out a species out of the world, this is the abundance it's going to be. And this is going to be something of variation. You know, not everything is equally abundant. And so what he said is that he kind of just picked his favorite model, what we would now call in modern language his favorite prior. And what he did is he said, OK, I like the gamma distribution. Abundances can't be negative, so I want something that's positive. He thought there's probably reasonably likely a, a unique maximum, so he wanted a unimodal distribution. Gamma does that for you as well. And he basically said abundances could be anywhere from like zero to as big as you want. So these three things, he sort of said, okay, well, this is kind of my favorite model for a univariate, a, a univariate sort of unimodal probability distribution on the positive real axis of the gamma. And what I've just done here is cribbed off Wikipedia, a bunch of plots of the gamma distribution for different values of the parameters. It's a two parameter model, kind of push around the mean and the variance by adjusting the parameters. And before I leave this, what I want you to notice something here, because it's going to come up in a few minutes, probably in about two minutes, one minute, is if you notice it, so the different colors here, I'm not sure how well they represent, but as we vary this parameter k and k gets smaller, what we're doing, that ends up doing is pushing the peak all the way down to zero, right? And so as k gets down to zero, you've basically pushed your unimodal distribution such that the single mode is right at zero. And that's going to come up in just a second. So, okay, so we've got two types of stochasticity down here. We've got a random abundance model. Now what we want to do is sort of ask about sampling. And what he said is, well, there are kind of two ways that we usually think about sampling. Assuming is we've got sort of binomial sampling. You either saw something or you didn't, right? That's the Bernoulli random variable, leads to the binomial distribution. Or if the likelihood of you see something is small enough, the binomial starts behaving like the Poisson distribution, the law of small numbers. And what Fisher kind of said is you're probably, again, you've been out at your two meter by two meter field site. You probably haven't seen the vast majority of things. So we're going to assume that you've only sort of very, very low probability of having sampled anything out there. So that's how he justified the Poisson distribution. What he said, though, and this is sort of the, the nice bit in this model, is that he imagines sort of there's this lambda, which is reflecting your sampling effort, and x is the abundance of the species. Right? The more abundant the species is, the more likely you are to see it. And this is kind of the very, very first example of what we might call a hierarchical model, sort of for those using the jargon of today, is you basically had sort of one model, which is the Poisson model of what you saw, step up the hierarchy, and they had a second stochastic model. The abundance was also modeled by a random variable. So this is kind of like, again, you know, you've heard things like you know, lovely words like hierarchical Bayesian modeling. Well, this is kind of, well, Fisher was certainly not a Bayesian, but this is sort of, sort of already we can see the beginnings of these ideas. So those are kind of two very biological, sort of very principled motivations for choosing those two distributions. But I suspect that the real reason that Fisher chose those two distributions is that he knew what happened when he combined them to each other. So what he did, again, sort of to use today's terminology, is he created a mixture model. And the probability that you sampled n individuals, and sort of just, that's not abundantly clear, whenever I use this sort of funky P over here, that's my universal symbol for probability. So the probability of seeing n individuals is you need to integrate the probability that you sampled n individuals 
given that you know the append abundant x over the unknown abundant x, which has its own probability distribution, mixture mob, take that mixture, and I get this integral here. I'm not going to try and repeat calculus for you. I'm going to just sort of take it for granted. But if I work out that integral, I get this expression here. And if you live and breathe statistics, then what you recognize this is, is there's a negative binomial distribution. So basically the mixture of a Poisson random variable with a gamma distributed prior on the, on the rate gives you a negative binomial. We'll come back to why this is called a negative binomial later, but before I do, I just want to make a couple comments. So if k was an integer, it doesn't have to be, but if it was, then this has a very simple interpretation probabilistically. Negative binomial says, you, I'm going to go out, I'm going to do a sampling, and I'm going to keep collecting samples until the first, let's say I'm, going to, I'm trying to sample, sample monarch butterflies. I'm going to keep grabbing samples so long as I still keep getting monarch butterflies. And then give me k, so let's say k is three. The first time that I get a, a third species that isn't a monarch, I'm going to stop. So it's kind of it's this idea, sort of a stopping sampling process. And that's basically sort of what the probability that you would see n things given these stopped if you failed to see at k times is the negative binomial when k is an integer. I said, it turns out that this makes sense for any k greater, greater than zero. And we often use it as such. And the last comment I want to make is that this distribution is important to us for a number of reasons. And it's basically, it's got a greater dispersion. So remember when I said sort of the Poisson distribution was this idea that if I'm really sampling very rare events, I expect to see a Poisson. Poisson is sort of unique in that it has an extremely low mean to variance ratio. The ratio of the mean of the Poisson to the variance of the Poisson is one. That's its dispersion. And what that kind of means is that Poisson data is very tightly clustered. And when we want to go our go-to model for data which is more dispersed, so has more variance relative to the mean than the Poisson model, we usually go to the negative binomial model. In fact, as soon as Chris just said, I've been doing a lot of infectious disease modeling in the last few years. And it turns out this is our go-to model for the number of infections caused by a single person is actually the negative binomial distribution. Okay. So now Fisher's got a model. It's what I would call a, phenomen a phenomenological model or maybe a semi-mechanistic model. He's not just pulling his favorite curve out of the air. He's starting out from reasoning to, produce, to sort of choose a model that he thinks is appropriate for the biology, but actually not really getting into the details of the biology. Now, what he wants to do at this point, of course, is simplify the model inside of some of the other information that's available. Now, the first thing to keep in mind is that if we're sampling, we can only talk about things we actually see, right? We don't know how many species there are out there. We just know that there are species. And so what he wanted to do at this point is say, okay, well, first of all, I'm going to ignore anything I don't sample because I can say nothing about stuff that I didn't sample. It's out there. The other thing he said is, that, okay, well, I'm going to say that there's probably a lot, a lot of species out there. I don't know what they are, but there's a lot of them. And if you have enough things, then sort of, in some sense, the definition of probability is that the number of species that you sample n times, if s is big enough, is just going to be s times the probability of sampling individuals. And so that gives them now, sort of, we've gone from a probability distribution on the abundance to a number which is case of capturing the number of things, sort of the number of things I should expect, I, the abundance that I expect to see of these things in a whole species pool. The problem, of course, is that again, I just said we don't know what S is. So we need to somehow get it out of the model. They said, okay, let's get S out of the model. It's, it's out there, it's, it's big. So I'm just going to take it to infinity good approximation, you know, sort of one, two, three, infinity. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that if you assume infinitely many species, if any of them have a non-zero abundance of appearing, guess what? You, you've got now sort of probability of sampling infinite. Essentially, you're going to sample everything infinitely often. That's not a very useful model. So what he did at the same time, he said, okay, well, I've got this parameter k. And what k does, remember what I said is that K was pushing those abundances so that all the abundances were sort of weighted towards zero. 
And then we said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat here. I'm going to take k to zero at the same time I take s to infinity. There are infinitely many species out there, but most of them are just like so rare I'm never going to see them. And I'm going to let that balance it out. And what he did is he sort of said, okay, I'm going to just sort of suppose that s times k go to a value alpha. And why that's nice, basically, is because he uses a couple of things that we know very well about this formula here is that, so the gamma distribution that I've got down here, if k is very close to zero, that's growing like one on k. So this whole thing I can approximate by s times k. n is actually sort of the number I observe, so that's a good thing. sk just kind of pops right out of the equation. And I'm left, sorry, this should be, my apologies, a typo, that should be an alpha over here. And this is what's called Fisher's alpha. Also, the whole this region is called Fisher's log series, and it's why. So just to clarify, yeah. that alpha is a parameter. It wasn't a parameter you used earlier? No, that's, that alpha, basically, remember what he says, alpha is just kind of this magic number. I'm going to take the number of species to infinity, I'm going to take their abundance to zero, and alpha is kind of this balancing factor. It, it's a fudge factor that, that Fisher put in the model. Yeah, and he wanted to get rid of S because he didn't know what S was. This is the way he did it. So again, this is called the log series because, oops, wrong button. I had over here, if you remember, sort of these abundances were proportional to P on N, which are the terms of the log of the Taylor series of the log function. What we said is that alpha times P over the n over n was the number of species that we saw n individuals of that sort of uh, number of species that we, we collected exactly n individuals of that species. So if I add up alpha times p to the n over n, what I'm doing is I'm adding up the total number of species that I saw. Call that quantity s prime. This is the number I observed. Now, what he argued then is say, well, alpha is in some sense a proxy for the species richness. If I were to sample enough, I would expect that the number of species that I sample is kind of more or less something to do with the actual number of species. The number of species I sample is proportional to alpha. So alpha is in some sense is dimension this parameter, which is telling us how many species there are out there. Yeah, oh, again, this is sometimes how we roll in statistics, right? Like, there's an infinite number, but of course, there's actually, in real life, there's only a finite number. It's big enough to be considered a... And it's big enough for a lot of our calculations, we're going to pretend it's infinite, but then we're going to come back at the end of the day, and actually, it really is a finite number, and we've got this other number, which we're going to fit to the data, which is sort of acting as a proxy for it. So yeah. Yeah. Again, for those of us who do physics, you know, sort of regularization and so... So now, again, remember what I said is that sort of p on alpha times p to the n over n was the number of species that I saw n representatives of, right? Maybe the, I'm talking about the monarch butterfly. So I th saw 13 monarch butterflies. The, that means that sort of on the whole, I saw a total, not just monarch butterflies, 13, but I saw alpha times p to the 13 over 13 species th that had exactly 13 representatives. Now, if I add up again, if there are n representatives of a species that was seen exactly n times, the total number of individuals in my sample is simply adding up here, and I can add up that too, and I get this expression here. And so what Fisher did is I said, okay, well, I've got two observables. First observable is the number of things I actually collected to my sample. The second observable is the number of species that I saw in my sample. And with those, I can solve for my two other parameters, alpha and p, which are giving me the whole distribution of species abundance. Right? That was the whole point of this. So, does, um, so to assume that s is alpha, does it mean also to assume that k is 1? Uh, k is 0, right? because it's, it's going down to 0. Uh, so again, what you want to think about is, is we're not assuming that. We're, kind of just, we're, we're saying that alpha is our proxy, the number of species. It's not the number of species, but somehow it's proportional to the number of species, and it's telling us 
the bigger alpha is, the more species there are. But don't think of it as the number of species. It's, it's, a, it's a parameter. It's a very classic parameter in ecology. In fact, if you take a course in, in quantitative ecology, you're going to do Fisher's alpha probably for a whole day in, in lectures and just go out and compute it. But it's a proxy. It's basically, it's a non-dimensionalized number that it's, the bigger it is, the more diversity there, the more species there are. But don't think of it as a, sort of, again, it's, it's related to the number of species, but it's not exactly the number of species. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, what I have then sort of, I can solve for alpha, I can solve for P, based on just two bits of data from my sample. And then I can see, well, when I take that alpha and that P, and I plot that whole curve out over all N, how is that going to compare to the data that I collected? And they did that. And this is the plot of the butterfly data. This is Corbett's data from the, from the light traps, plotted against Fisher's formula. So again, up here, fortunately, I just took this right out of the paper and they didn't have a good habit of putting labels on their axes back in the 1940s, apparently. But the vertical axis is the number of species that were counted. Horizontal axis is the abundance. So with a whole bunch of things that they saw exactly once, not too many things that they saw more than about 50, 40, 50 times. So again, so if you sort of that parameter n is going across here, this is n equals one, n equals two, it's the number I saw. This is the number sampled of that species. And this dotted line here is the log, is Fisher's log curve. And you see, it actually, I mean, this is what we would call a damn good fit, basically. I mean, technical term that. And so this is kind of why Fisher's alpha is eco, ecology 101 if you happen to do quantitative ecology. So, I want to stop here for just a second. So this is sort of you, sort of segment number one of the talk. And if this was already like too many equations, again, just say I, I'm checking out. Because I'm basically, each time I go, I'm going to ramp it up a little bit each time. Like, I kind of wanted to have a little something for everyone or, or nothing for everybody or whatever. OK. Are there any questions up to this point? Any more questions? So let's go ahead. So, We've got this great model, fits the data fantastically. We know how to fit the parameters for the model. Really easy summary statistics, like, like two numbers give me all the parameters in the model. Great model. But you might want to ask, well, sort of, why did Fisher make the modeling assumptions that he did, right? He kind of just waved his hand and said, yeah, it's, it's a gamma. Right, like, you know, gammas do what I like, gam you know, sort of what I think population should do. They're, there's a peak abundance, there's tails, there's probably, n m you know, there aren't too many species that sort of like, either they're like 50 or they're one, like but nothing in between. Like it's, it, it was kind of, it was just a completely qualitative choice of a model in order to get, to capture population dynamics. And, you know, I said, it's, it's a good one, it's a reasonable one, I'm not criticizing it. It's the kind of stuff we do every day when we do statistics, we say, well, Let's pick a, mo a prior a statistical model which has the right properties qualitatively based on what I think things should do, and I'm going to run with that. But, and where I want to go for the rest of the time that I have today, is a deep dive into what I like to do. Sort of, if you will, sort of Fisher is statistics. I have a more statistical physics point of view. And if you sort of, if, 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 I don't know, are there any physicists in the crowd here or people who did some physics? Cool. Okay. So what do we do with statistical physics, right? I mean, what we say is that, like, you know, there's the ideal gas law. Ideal gas law does great. It predicts all kinds of stuff. But at the end of the day, gases aren't these perfect fluids, right? They're like, they're not magical things that are everywhere all at once. Gases are comprised of molecules and atoms. And we would like to do is rather than kind of just sort of go, okay, the ideal gas law works, we're done. And we like to say, okay, well, can we actually go back to an individual based model and reconstruct the ideal gas law, right? That's, that's kind of what we do when we do statistical physics. We say that, as I said, you know, my little bit of zealotry that I came at the beginning, 
The world is based on individuals. Everything else is emergent properties. So can I start with an individual-based model and get what I want as an emergent property? And that's where I want to go to for the next half hour to an hour, kind of see how far we get. I've got enough, so I've got enough material to keep going all day, and it's kind of just up to your patience and, and tolerance. So remember I talked about demographic stochasticity. This is sort of ground zero of, of sort of stochasticity in biological systems. Individuals are different. We are all have our uniqueness. We all do things a little bit differently. And from my point of view as a population modeler, all the things that I really care about are our birth, you know, we all give birth differently, we all die differently, and we all move around a little differently, right? Everything else is your own business. I'm just interested in births, deaths, and movement. Again, sort of to repeat what I just said, I had these nice parameters, cal, uh, K and theta, which were just like the generic parameters. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious whether what was done to find the curve here ends up being equivalent if you do the math out to a maximum likelihood fit, or, or if it's not the same. Uh, so, um, I guess, we, so, um, you know, to be honest, I don't remember. It's been a while since. They, is actually, yeah. They effectively, they're using, they, they have, because obviously when they did this, you know, they didn't have computers, you can come up with some practical fitting strategy, which is either is maximum likelihood or it is not. Yeah, and that's kind of often what happens to some statistics, and I don't want to, the whole kettle of fish I don't want to get into today, is it often ends up happening is one of the nice thing about our mechanistic models is they actually give us sort of show us how these statistical, that these, these parameters actually are maximum likelihood parameters in these models. Like just, this is sort of just like, he basically just said, like, what we really like to do is have two summary statistics that I can guess fit without having to ever use a computer, okay? So this is going to be sort of, uh, Again, sort of, I go here. Also, so this is going to be sort of, well, it's almost like the Monty Python moment, and now for something completely different. So, I'm going to switch from talking about statistical modeling to talking about more of a stochastic modeling, and particularly sort of a statistical physics, stochastic processes point of view. And what I'm going to try and do for the next little bit is try and give you mechanistic individual based models that are going to get to, to, Fisher's, to Fisher's gamma distribution. Why would I want to do that? You know, am I just a zealot? Am I someone who enjoys pain? Am I, am I someone, a masochist who thinks mathematical modeling is fun? Possibly all of the above. But really, what you should care about this if you're interested in, in actual doing biology as opposed to, I'm kind of just happy just doing math, is that we had these parameters, k and theta, took k to zero, what does that really mean to take k to zero? What's the biological implication of that? It kind of made things rare, but how did it make things rare? Data parameter, that was just something out there. He just kind of, there was no meaning to it whatsoever. They gave him the things that he wanted. They gave him flexibility, two parameters, he could twist them around. But remember I said, you know, give me five parameters and I can give you a, a, an elephant. So what I'd like to do is rather than have parameters that are just kind of there, I'd like my parameters to be rooted in actual biology, things that I can measure, things that I can, I don't have to fit. I you have to fit in a different way, but it's like, if one of my parameters is your height, I can go through here and it take a while, but I can measure everyone's height in this room and I can fit a distribution to that. And then I have a mechanistic meaning of that parameter. Like it's, it's an experimental parameter, something I can measure in individuals. And so what I'd like to think about here is can we come up with a mechanistic model that's going to give us the, ga the gamma distribution. So that instead of having these kind of say, well, we're magically gonna fit these parameters, these are now measurable parameters that we can go to and sample out in the field. And what I want to talk about sort of for the next, however long as it takes, is probably the simplest possible population model that has ever been devised. The birth and death process. And again, what I said is from a point of view of biology, from a point of view of population biology, in some sense, all we care about is, do you give birth, do you give die? That gives me the number of individuals, that gives me the abundance, all right? So we're kind of taking it down to about the sine qua non of abundance. And the way we formulate that probabilistically is we imagine, okay, 
we talk about rates. Whenever I talk about rates, I'm talking about in this probabilistic sense of a rate. So I mean, a lot of you are used to think about rates of flow of a fluid. I want to think about probabilistic rates. So probabilistic rates mean that if the rate is P, it means in a period of time, short period of time, you know, a year, then the rate times the length of time gives me the probability of something happening in that time period. Right? So rates in this case are probability per unit time. Let's fix some notation these throughout. So I'm interested in a species abundance. Abundance is counting the number of individuals. I'm going to let n of t be the number of individuals in my species at time t, my hypothetical species. n of t is a, is a random variable. It can take any positive integer value. And what we want to do is, is construct a mathematical model for this quantity n of t. Again, all I'm going to do is to say that n of t chain either goes up by one when someone gives birth, which happens probability p, b per unit time. It goes down by one at rate d, so per unit time, it goes down by probability d times the length of time. And these give me, and you often see these represented as Q matrices, which is why I chose this notation, two possible types of event. If I had n individuals, each of them has a per capita birth rate of B, then BN is the rate at which I'm producing new individuals. Here's my new individual I've just produced. Q, D, well, N individuals, they each die at rate D. Population goes down by one. So this is now the rate that I lose an individual. I said, I like simple models. This is pretty simple. Things birth, give birth, things give, die. Simple model, but you can already do so much with this and you can spend like, like I can really spend a course on models like this. So the first thing I wanna do, and probably for most of you, this is all you really care about is how do I simulate this process, right? Like, I mean, that's always the first thing you wanna do when you get inside of the system is that you just run off, you program it, you go into your computer and say, okay, let her rip, let's see what this thing actually looks like. And then, you get excited and you go off and you spend the next six months doing mathematical modeling based on that. So now let me start off with sort of the dumbest possible algorithm for doing this. I say the dumbest possible one is the first one that everyone comes up with on their own because it's the obvious one. And like what I told you says so it's sort of the things happen with rate. Remember I said these sort of these rates were probability per unit time. So I discretize time, right? With my, I'm working with a computer. I can't talk about continuous time. I can only talk about discrete time units. So I'm going to sort of say, like, I'm just going to pick some arbitrarily time step delta t. Delta means it's small, so a small bit of t. And I chunk up time, so there's a zero. I have to start off with some number of individuals at time zero. I'll call that n naught. Then I look at the first time step, and I say, well, a birth happened in that time set with probability b times I one individual, so b1 delta t. That my individual died with probability d, d times delta t, so d delta t times one. And with one minus that, nothing happens, and so I move on to the next time step. And if I keep doing this, right, you can kind of see, like, I'm, that's exactly a description of the model that I showed you, right? Like I'm just basically saying, okay, at each time step, see, did, did someone die? Did someone give birth? Move to the next time step. Did someone die? Did someone give birth? And so forth. Now, remember what I said is sort of the probability per unit time was B, per individual per unit time was B delta T. If n individuals, d times n times delta t is going to be bigger than one if n is big enough. So this is a bad algorithm because the first thing is that sort of, I have to choose my time step super small or otherwise I'm just gonna, my, my simulations are just like, what does it mean for something to happen with probability two? Like probability two is not a meaningful concept. Like probability is a number between zero and one. So I need to take a really time, small time step. Not great. So the next obvious thing to do is, well, the other, sort of the other problem with this, of course, is I take my really, really, really small time step in order to avoid things just barfing at some point. And now I basically, like, most of the time, nothing happens. And so I end up sort of waiting a very long time for anything to happen. And I've just now run like computing budget out the window by basically seeing a whole bunch of nothing happen with occasional events. Not a great model either, which is why I want to sort of take a next, sort of immediately jump onto sort of what actually is the next, well, maybe not quite the next simplest algorithm, but sort of the algorithm that everyone uses more or less in real life. C. 
So let's be smart. Let's use a bit of probability theory. So if you notice, this has all been sort of carefully constructed so that I can bring in a bunch of ideas that are sort of standard vocabulary and standard ideas and probability and stochastic processes one by one. And the first thing I'm going to bring in is the idea of a waiting time. All right, so what I said is that if delta t was small enough, you're going to spend a lot of time waiting for something to happen. So I'm in a certain state right now. And for me, the state is the number of individuals. The waiting time is, well, how long do I have to wait until the next time someone gives birth or someone dies? That's the, my waiting time t. Because if you think about it, if we want to be smart about this, is that what we would like to do is break this apart. There's a waiting time, which I'd like to figure out. And I sort of just plug that into my computer and say, okay, wait this much time, then event happens. And I can now sort of save myself a whole lot of computing power by just sort of saying, well, figure out how long I have to wait, figure out what happens, reset the system, figure out how long I have to wait till the next event, figure out what happens, reset the system, and go from there. Now, how long do I have to wait for the next thing to happen? If I have n individuals, b delta t, dn delta t is the probability that one of them died in my small time step delta t. d n delta t is the probability that one of them, di that one of them died in, that in a time step delta t. 1 minus b plus d n delta t is the probability that nothing happened in the time step delta t. If nothing happened before time t, t divided by delta t is basically what I'm doing is I'm sort of taking like, you know, maybe t is 100 and delta t is 0 0.1. 100 divided by 0 0.1 is, I have 1,000 cycles that happened before anything happened. Right? So this is basically measuring the number of cycles of discrete time up into time t. Nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened this many times. And that's giving me the distribution of the waiting time distribution. So how long do I have to, that, what's the probability that nothing happened for at least time little t? If you take that, that delta t to zero, what I hope everyone remembers from first year calculus is that you get the limit as an exponential. And this is good. Remember what I said, we had to take those, those, those delta t's had to get really small in order to avoid everything from just crapping out when, when n was big and delta t was bigger than one. I'm going to take it all the way to zero, and I've got a sta statement here which is sensible, and it says that the time that I have to wait is, and this is an exponential distribution, obviously named because it's an exponential, and the two things about this, I mean, this is what we call the rate of the exponential, and on average, what you find when you integrate this is that the average waiting time is one on b on, on plus d, so, so it's and a small waiting time is maximal, and the bigger n gets, the, the less waiting time there is. Uh, it's really easy, you know, if you go into R and tell me, give me an exponential, exponentially distributed random variable rate, my favorite rate, that's just a function in R. I can write that in, in a bit of code in, in one line. Second step in my smarter algorithm. So I sort of said, okay, I now know how long I have to wait to the next event. I'm just going to figure out, okay, Instead of doing all those steps, I'm just going to say, okay, well, this is how long I would have waited. Write down that number and jump to what, what actually happens when something happens. In this case, I had two choices, right? Remember, because I don't know what happened. I just know that something happened. That something was either a birth or a death. Well, if it, one or the other happened, some of the two probabilities has to be one. Probability of birth is this, probability that it was a death was this. Weight that out so it equals to one, and I get that the probability that a birth happened, conditional on something happened, right? I mean, the delta t's tell me whether or not it happened in this particular piece of time. This is just telling me that I know something happened, what happened? And either it had sort of it was a birth with b over b plus d, death with d over b plus d. And this is again a pretty easy thing to compute. It's basically, you know, sort of it's a Bernoulli random variable. Some, you know, did something happen, did something not happen? Toss a coin, like a weighted coin. Again, this is something that is, you can implement in one function in R if you're like me, an R user. Use a bit of terminology that I'm gonna keep using. This is what's called the skeleton of the Markov process that I described. So the Markov process is the whole beast with sort of time 
and events. The skeleton is if I just sort of throw away all the time information and just keep the, what, what actually happened at each time step, that's called the skeleton. And it turns out to be a super useful tool for studying Markov chains. So as I said, this, takes, this algorithm takes about three lines to implement an R, so I did. Although I'm mostly a pencil and paper guy, I can manage three lines in R to write a code. And here what I did is I basically ran exactly that algorithm I described to you. So I, gener I started off each of these simulations with one individual. First thing I did is I sort of said, well, what's the waiting time to the first event? Calculated that number. What happened at the first event? And I either, if the first event was a birth, I upped the population size by one. If the first event was a death, I dropped the population size by one. Took my new state, drew the next waiting time. Yeah. Well, that's something that actually what I've done is I've computed the time I have to wait until the next thing happens. Oh, okay. right, 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 right. And that's the trick, right? Is, I, is I, I only, I basically sort of, I can just right now, a priori, I can say like, how long do I have to wait to the next event? The event happens, so I'm going to jump to that event, right? Like, I, I'm not going to waste my time saying oh, nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. So I did that. So basically, I sort of, what I'm doing here is in this case, each of these points here, and I'm sorry they're not visible, is that I start off with one individual, and then I had to wait a bit of time. There was a birth, and then another birth, and then for some reason I'm missing a dot here somewhere. I don't know how that happened. But basically, you can sort of see that there's a few time steps, and this was with a birth rate of a half and death rate of one, and it kind of got all, all the way out to time 1.3, roughly. So an excitingly long lived population, an exciting simulation that saw a maximum population of size of two that was achieved and then went extinct in very rapidly. So my second simulation, and I'll, you notice I've these things have names, which is why I did this, is I simulated, I said, let's say the birth death rate and the death rate were exactly equal to each other. Did exactly the same algorithm, ran it. Oh, things are a bit more exciting. We lasted almost a little bit past five time steps all the way to an exciting eight individuals, and then sudden death. And then the third one, I took the birth rate to be twice the death rate. Shocking to nobody, I'm sure, in the room, I got exponential population growth. And this basically sort of ran out last, you know, I basically stopped it as soon as I had 100 things happen. And so at 100 events, I had a population of 45, and under three time steps. So kind of just stopped it there. And you kind of, and so this is, I'm hoping that I'm showing not a great model for what Fisher did, right? Because basically what we see is either things kind of died out, die out, or they're like huge right away. Not, this does not look like a gamma distribution, right? Like, Before I go any further, I just want to say that what I just described to you is the Gillespie algorithm. Uh, we heard it mentioned, I think it was you who mentioned that yesterday. This is, Gillespie really won on this one actually, because this idea was around since about the 1920s, but he wrote a paper in 1976 where he explained how to do it for chemists. And this paper has like got to be the most insanely cited paper I've ever seen in probability theory. Uh, and basically all I've just done here is I've written down, I've codified the algorithm that I just showed you using basically sort of just writing it out in its fullness. And it's basically, this is like your one-stop shopping for simulating st uh, Markov processes of arbitrary complexity in the rates. Uh, you can still use this. Uh, what you find is that it's fast, but not as fast as you'd like. Uh, and so there are lots of improvements on it. Uh, just for, if you're interested in doing these kind of simulations, look up tau leaping or adaptive tau leaping. These are kind of the refined, speeded up versions of this algorithm. But even then, and why I like analytical mathematics as opposed to probability simulations, is I've got a manuscript that I was hoping to have done before I arrived today, which is not. And my colleague ran supercomputers for weeks to get something that I was able to, the same curve that I was able to predict with my analytical formula on my crappy old laptop in fractions of a second of processor time, we got the same curve basically. And it, but of course, when you write a paper with statistic processes, there's always the point where you draw your analytical curve through a bunch of points of say, hey, it works. But again, why, sort of again, I'm a zealot. Analytical methods are great because you know, 
no matter how fast you make your algorithms, analytical methods are faster and they give you more insight. So after that brief aside, and there are lots of asides here, as I said, this is kind of not a great model. Like it's a simple model, we can do everything we want with it, and I'm not gonna be able to do everything I want with it because I'm running out of time already. Uh, but it's got a lot of shortcomings, and, and the most obvious thing is it's sort of, it's either going to infinity or it's going to zero. Not a great way of getting an, an abundance distribution through time. So what I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna actually go back and put some more biology in my model, right? And I owe to more biology. So clearly infinite populations, not much, you know, that's, don't wanna deal with those. First attempt at doing a model, I'm gonna sort of restrict myself to the attention where I'm gonna say that the population just craps out, peters out, my first slide there. And you're like, well, that's not really getting me very far because you just said like, you know, I've gotten rid of blow up and I just have a population that's gonna go extinct eventually. What I'm gonna do is something which, bringing in another one of my favorite sources of randoms, which is random dispersal. And I'm just gonna assume that there's migration into my, my population is not a closed population. Maybe it's the Galapagos Islands and I'm waiting, and there are finches that are gonna come on my island every once in a while. So I'm gonna add migration to the model. I'm gonna sort of say, okay, well, populations are gonna die out on their own, but there's migrants coming to the population. Maybe that's gonna be enough to keep it going. If I uh, was nearly as fast as I thought I would, uh, we would have had a nice little set of slides here where I would have shown you that what I said is actually mathematically true, but let's just skip that. <laughs> what I'm gonna do instead is sort of come back and talk about this birth, death, and migration process. So not the simplest model, it's the simplest model plus epsilon. I now got migration from the mainland. I'm gonna assume, I'm gonna assume that there's a rate of migration that arrives from the mainland at rate mu giving me now two types of, my events are now not birth and death, but birth or migration and death. Migration in this case is independent, like, you know, I'm gonna assume that migration is population independent. My, my finch does not look at the Galapagos Island and say, hey, that looks like there's a whole bunch of, of finches hanging out there, I'm gonna go join them. It just goes and sort of says, I'm going, I'm going out there and we'll see, what, you know, we'll see what happens when I get there. So just a very simple model. The thing just kind of just land on the island willy-nilly. Proceeding as above, well, we just skipped that slide, but I can actually write down a differential equation for the expected size of the population now. And again, because I skipped over two slides, I'm assuming this is all familiar from everyone's statistics class, but expectation is just the average over all possible outcomes, right? Uh, geek culture has, counted, has caught up with us in such a way they can say that in all the multiverse, we're going to take the average over all possible outcomes in all possible worlds in the multiverse, everything everywhere all at once, average over that, and that's what, I'm going to, and that's what the expectation is. All possible realizations of this process, what's the average of them? If I do that, in this case, with my birth, death, and migration process, I get this simple ODE, which describes the average population size at time t. And what you notice here, and it's sort of got some nice benefits here, is that if I take t to infinity, it goes to a finite number that is neither zero nor infinite. So it's kind of like a pretty good contender already for the kind of modeling that I'd like to do, right? It's, it's something which is settling down to what seems like a sensible population. Like it's going to be finite. Uh, oh shoot, there should be a new right here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Missing new right here, which is basically what's happening is, you, and this is just interesting, exponential decay of population being fed by migration, which should be right here, <laughs> feeding in new individuals, keeping it going. What I wanna do is get some understanding of this model, which now has birth and migration in it. I'm gonna think about it as a stochastic model, and so, what I want to get sort of is sort of the sort of the first of many big hammers that we use in this field. And that's the idea of a master equation. And what I want to do is find the master equation for the birth, death, and migration process that I talked about. What is a master equation? Well, I'm ultimately interested in, to, if I want to describe a stochastic process, 
what I want to do is, is know the probability that it's in any given state at any given time. Probability that I have n individuals at time t, and I'm going to write that as p n of t. The master equation is basically a way of, summary, of summarizing what can happen in the model in sort of in transitions between states. And so what I want to ask is, assuming that I, if I move forward again, going back to my discrete time, I like discrete time, it's something I can reason with. I want to have, so what's the probability I start off at time t and I go one time step forward, delta t forward. What's the probability that I'm in state n a little bit of time into the, into the, you know, one delta t into the future? Well, if I'm in state n one time step into the future, I either had to, either sort of one at the present, either I have n minus one individuals or n plus one individuals, right? Because that's the only type of changes I have in this whole system. They either go up by one or they go down by one. So I want to do is basically start, sort of consider that either I started off in the state with n minus one individuals, and that was the probability n minus, p n minus one t, or I started off in the state with n plus one individuals at time t, or nothing happened in delta t, so I started off in the state with n individuals. The master equation says, okay, well, how do I get from n to n minus one is that I start in n minus one and either a birth or a migration happened in that time step of delta t. The other way that I could be in state, not sure what I just did here. Okay, it's gone. The other possibility, I could have, I got into state n because I started out in state n plus one and then somebody died in that time step delta t. Or I started out in state n and nothing happened. You squint at that long enough, what you figure out is a bit of algebra, is I'm gonna get, I can, I'm gonna be able to get one, on this right hand side, I'm gonna get one copy of PNT, which I bring over here. Everything that is a multiple of delta t, I divide by delta t. Some, you know, f of t plus delta t minus f of t over delta t, first year calculus is the Newton quotient. Take delta t to zero and that's the derivative. So I do that bit of algebra and I now get a system of ordinary differential equations described the time evolution of these probabilities. And you'll notice basically what's characterizing this is exactly the sort of the chip. The infinitesimal change in, in a time step is where you started off rate, you know, starting from one state, the probability of going from that state to that state, or you started in another state, probability of going that state to that to the original state, and so forth. And in one dimensional example, and so this is now everything, this is actually an infinite system of ordinary differential equations. Right? The population could be zero, could be one, could be a hundred million. And as much as we all love simulating ODEs, good luck simulating infinitely many ODEs at the same time, right? So this is not something you then sort of plug into your computer and run with. But, and in fact, you can sometimes solve these things analytically, but usually you just get some complicated formula like, yeah, great, okay, whatever. So what we want to do is sort of think about better ways of getting insight out of this master equation than just trying to figure out what, what its solution is. Kind of come a bit far from my original inspiration, which was Fisher model, Fisher's model. But Fisher sort of said, like, there was just sort of this, this abundance distribution out there in the world of species abundance. And it didn't change through time. It was a time independent thing. So in some sense, what Fisher was saying is that, well, I'm just going to ignore all the transient behavior and just sort of assume that if I wait long enough, every population eventually stabilizes, might stabilize, go extinct, stabilize at zero, might, in this case, migration prevents that. So it's stabilizing on some possible state. And we're all used to sort of looking for the stable states of ODEs. Probability, we don't have a stable state, right? It's a random process, random stuff is happening. So I can't say that I'm in this state if I wait long enough. What I can say is the probability of being in any given state settles down, right? And this is what, so it's a state distribution. You know, I might be in state 35, I might be in state seven, 
randomly, but the probability that I'm in each of those states is independent of time. Like, this is a station. That, that, that idea clear to people, it's just kind of this idea, it's like it just, all the transit has gone away, and it's now sort of not where you are is fixed, but the probability of being where you are becomes fixed in time. Because that's what Fisher was talking about in some sense. He sort of said, like, oh, there is this kind of abundance distribution, and it doesn't really change much, and that's what the species abundance distribution is. So with my master equation, what that meant doing, well, if I take t to infinity and things aren't changing anymore, then this derivative goes to zero. I, I change my notation to sort of say that I'm, I'm no longer dealing with time, I'm dealing with something which has happened after the transients are over. And I get from my master equation, this much, this algebraic equation, which is describing the relationship between states in the stationary distribution. And the ideal thing is if I could solve this, then I would be able to have a distribution of abundances after kind of all the, all the details have washed out. It's just sort of like the long-term behavior of populations. Now, so great, I've traded an infinite system of ordinary differential equations for an infinite dimensional system of algebraic equations. Still not going to be something I can plug into my computer and solve. But I don't have to. And the reason I don't have to is because of just a very, very simple observation that I can make right here. This is my equation. This equation, had, this had to be equal to zero. Sorry, the missing is zero equals over here. This equals zero was the thing that characterized the stationary distribution. I mean, I gather up the terms like this. Kind of, they're basically the same thing, only sort of n minus one becomes n, n becomes n plus one. And if each of these things is individually zero, then the whole thing is zero. And so that's an, an, a much simpler equation for describing the stationary distribution. I've now gone from to a very, very simple equation here. So long as this relationship is true, this will be zero, and I'm talking about the stationary distribution. This is what's called detailed balance. And what, it's, what makes a detailed balance is a balance. The death rate out of n individuals is exactly balanced by the birth and migration rate out of n minus one individuals. So if these rates are balanced, then nothing changes, right? Well, I mean, things change, but they on average, nothing changes because sort of there's an exact balance between the movement of probability from one state to the other. Detailed balance relations are your friend when you're doing this kind of modeling because essentially, I'm sure that there are examples out there where you can solve these equations without the detailed balance relations, but I can probably count them on one hand. Basically, sort of if you can solve it, detailed balance probably holds. If I rearrange that equation, I get this, right? And what's great about that is because I can do, on a few lines of algebra, I can do something which I could not do in a computer, which is solve this infinite system. So ratio of pi n to pi n plus one, so the ratio of the probability in this state to the ratio being the probability in this state, is characterized by this ratio of rates. Well, I want to know ultimately pi n for all n. The ratio of pi n to pi zero is the product, n to n minus one, n minus one, n minus two. But this equation tells me how to fill in every one of these things here. It gives me this expression here on the right. Now, I still have to figure out what pi of zero is because what this feels sort of, got pi n over here, got something nice and pinned down over here. But pi over zero right now is still kind of an unknown quantity. Right, it's just multiplying through everything at the moment. So how do I figure out what pi of zero is? Well, the whole point was this thing was supposed to be a probability distribution. And probability distribution means that you have to be in some state at all times. And so the probability of being in each state has to add up to one, right? Otherwise, you're just kind of vanished out of the universe somehow. Like, and so all I can just basically do is then sort of pi, the sum of the pi n's, is pi of zero times the sum of these quantities here. You know, this gives me a relationship that I can solve pretty easily for pi of zero. And 
I'm not going to belabor you with the details, but I do just a little bit of algebra, and I can actually figure out what this infinite, this infinite sum of products is. Da, 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 da. And it gives me 1 minus d over d to the minus. So you're wondering why it was called a negative binomial distribution at the beginning? Here's a binomial. Here's a negative exponent. These may or may not still look familiar to you from where I started off at the beginning of the day. These are more or less the, the terms of the negative binomial probability distribution. I put all that together, and I've now got this stationary distribution, which is describing the abundance of a population with birth, death, and sustained by migration. And I got exactly the negative binomial distribution that I got an hour ago as a mixture model that Fisher worked with. Unlike Fisher's model, my parameters mean something biologically. What we got going on here? We've got the Fisher's k, remember that was the parameter that he had in his gamma distribution, is now taken up here by gamma over b. So nu over b. Nu is the migration rate. So in other words, Fisher's k was proportional to the migration rate into the population, where if this is the right model, the right individual-based model to get to Fisher. The p in Fisher's log series is now b over d. b is birth rate. b is death rate. 1 over your death rate is, your average, is the average individual lifespan. We said that B was the, was the number of births per unit time. Rate of events per unit time times chunk of time gives me what? The number of events over a lifespan, a number of reproductive events over a lifespan. That's fitness. So in other words, rather than just having these magical parameters that came out of nowhere in Fisher's model, I now have two very biological parameters, migration and fitness. This is why I like individual-based models. Unlike Fisher's model, this doesn't account for sampling, right? This is just a population model. Remember, whereas Fisher's had sampling in it too. So you might be, at this point, you probably, those of you who haven't just sort of just clocked out are probably saying like I'm cheating here because I haven't actually talked about sampling yet. So don't worry, I've got this covered. What I want to do is think about now what happens, well, can I get, the, how would I get sampling in this model? And before I do that, what I'm going to say is that I'm going to use this again. If you notice here, what I've been trying to do here is just like this, is basically trying to give you like a bunch of our tools along the way in telling the story. So I'm going to give you the next important tool in the probabilist statistical models toolkit, which is the probability generating function. Probability generating function is kind of a bookkeeping device. It's a super useful bookkeeping device that allows you to do a lot of computations a lot faster. Remember what I said is that I have infinitely many probabilities here. I don't want to deal with infinitely many things at once. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn them into one thing. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use my probabilities as the coefficient in a power series. Z is just some kind of, it's just Z. It's, it's a variable. It doesn't mean anything. But the resulting object is basically taking all those probabilities and packing them into one object, one function. If you want to recover the probabilities from the, if you know the function, you can get the probabilities just by using differentiation and Taylor series. Take the root of this n times, n, n minus one, da, 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 put z equal to zero, and what I'm left with is n factorial times probability. A bit more work, and I can get all the moments of the distribution out of the moment generating function. So it's a nice, if I've got a moment generating function, it basically tells me everything I want to know about the infinite set of probabilities in one handy thing that I can actually do stuff. Why I want to be able to do stuff with it is because, and I'm not going to burden you with deriving this from first principles, but if you go and look on Wikipedia, 
you can see that the negative binomial distribution, which is what I started off with, with the parameters k and p, remember, so that's, those are Fisher's k and p, but for me, k is my proportional migration and p is the fitness. You sum that up and you get this nice simple expression for the moment gener uh, probability generating function. Everything you want to know about the negative binomial distribution is encoded in this one function. Anything that, any probability distribution that has a function that looks like this is a negative binomial distribution. So basically, I can use this to figure out what probability distribution, if I know what the moment in generating function is, probability generating function is, I can use it to figure out what the, what the object is. Again, that's my first example, and you kind of, it's pretty obvious where this one came from, and sort of why I chose this example, because I want to do something with negative binomial distribution. The other probability generating function I want to show you is the simplest probability generating function, which is for a Bernoulli random variable. So Bernoulli random variable is a biased coin toss. I take a coin, I flip it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a not a fair coin, and so it isn't 50-50. With probability Q, it comes up with heads. I'll call that a one. Probability one minus Q, it comes up with zero. Tails, that's my zero. And if I encode that as a probability generating function, what I said, remember, is that the probability that it gave me n equals zero, z to the zero is one. That's the probability that n equals zero. Probability that n equals one, because remember this only has two possible states. Probability is one is Q, and z to the power of one is encoding that information. Now, the reason I, have, I chose these two examples is that if I want to think about it, sampling in one of the easiest ways to model sampling is, well, either I saw something or I didn't, right? It's kind of, a, it's kind of the idiot's model of, of sampling, but it says I went out there and out in my field site, my two, meter, my two square meter plot, there are a hundred species, but basically any given one of them I saw maybe with probability of 10%. And so I'm going to assume that sort of, that's just an independent thing. It's, it's, it's a very toy model sampling, but it's kind of, this is more of an illustration. So if I wanted to put sample, so what I said right now is that my mechanistic model of population abundance said that the number of things out there should be distributed as a negative binomial. And I see them according to a, bino according to a, bino a Bernoulli random variable. Toss a coin, I saw it or I didn't. So I have n individuals, and I'm gonna have, for each individual out there on the plot, which is a random number because I don't know how many, I have an indicator variable, bi. bi is one if I saw it, bi is zero if I didn't see it. So the number that I observed after sampling is simply the sum of the bi's, right? It's, these are only one if I actually saw the thing, so out of the ones, I get the number of things I actually saw. Now, let's pretend for a moment that n is fixed and we know what it, what it is. We're just, we're just gonna just posit n is known. I'm gonna compute the probability generating function of n prime, the number of things I saw, assuming that there are big n things out there to be seen. And that's simply said to the power of, of this sum and I just wrote out some here. If I assume that each, I saw things independently, the average, if they're independent events, you can just sort of split, the expectation just split. It becomes a product of expectations, right? Like, there's nothing to connect, there's no covariance. So this is a product of z to the b1, z to the b2, da, da, da. But they're independent, so I can take the product out. I already computed what each of these individuals was just on the last slide. It was one minus Q plus Q times Z. N terms, they're all identical, so it gives me this power here. But N, this unknown num true number of species with negative binomial distributed. I'm now gonna average over all possible states of the negative binomial. Well, this is Remember I said, probability generating function would just take, put your variable z in here, your dummy variable, take it to the power of the random variable. Here's, I replaced z with something more complicated, but I've got the same, the same power. That's just the same as changing z to this in my power, in my probability generating function. I do that, and lo and behold, I get another negative binomial distribution 
but now taking into account sampling. So in other words, rather than being fish like, yeah, gammas are great, Poisson distributions are great, we just sort of basically went from an individual-based mechanistic model to getting exactly the same model that the Fisher had, only in we, we, have a, we have an underlying population model underneath. So apparently I've prepared about enough material for about a week. So, but luckily enough it's modular and this is gonna be where we can, we can stop here. Now, Because I have not changed, the, let's have a look sort of, remember, Fisher, on the other hand, started off with a gamma distribution describing abundances and got a negative binomial distribution for abundances with sampling. I started off with abundance, got a negative binomial for abundances and turned that into a negative binomial for sampling. But let's come back to the gamma and how could we get to the gamma and why is the gamma maybe not a, such a bad guess after all? Let's go back to my original, this is my original, oops, that should be a K not an R down there. But this is the negative binomial describing the abundances of the population without sampling. Again, that should be a K. Here are my parameters. Now what I said, remember, we went back sort of this K parameter, sorry, is the mutation rate weighted by birth, right? The P parameter was fitness. And remember what I said, for this not to be just blowing up ridiculously, I had to assume that individual, that B was, le was less than D. So everyone has fitness less than one. I'm gonna write the fitness as not the full fitness, but the relative fitness is one minus S. Everyone has fitness less than one. If I assume that individual fitness is small, when I replace P by one minus S here, so I've just done here, so replace P by one minus S. I get this expression here. If S is small, this is approximately minus S. So I get this, and this starts to look a little bit more like the gamma distribution that I started, that Fisher started off with. If I assume that the abundances are large, then I can use this approximation to get rid of these gamma, dis these, ah, so awful, this should both be a K. The ratio of these two is approximately end of the K. And when I make that approximation, I get exactly the form of a gamma distribution. NS is now weighing population abundance in is weird, it's a weird unit, I'll, I'll grant you that. But I'm, rather than measuring the absolute abundance of individuals, the number of individuals, I'm gonna say that I'm going to measure in units of one over the relative fitness. So I'm kind of just rescaling going from the number of individuals to this kind of weirdly rescaled. And provided that I started off with large populations and very small fitness, I get exactly the gamma distribution that Fisher came up with. So in other words, and again, sort of this is my, my statistical mechanics point of view, I wanted to get back to the ideal gas law at the end of the day. But what I've done is I've gotten back to Fisher's original hypothetical gamma, where now we see, okay, the P was fitness, the K was the mutation rate. And what Fisher was effectively doing, though he never thought about it this way, he just was doing stuff to make his math work, was he was assuming that abundances are very large. He was assuming that fitnesses are very, very close to one. And so what we can arrive at, under these simplifying assumptions, we rederive Fisher's model from an entirely mechanistic point of view. I have run out of time, which is good. You've probably run out of patience. If anyone wants to talk with me at some point, I actually have about another three lectures where I get sort of basically get a whole bunch of nasty mathematics. I did say I thought you were going to do math before. Yeah, I, I tend to do that. And what I did basically was to show you that you could come up with gamma distributions with an entirely different set of mechanisms. So my first mechanism was an island bio, biogeography model where I said there were births and there were deaths and there was migration to my island, and that gave me distribution. Give me two hours of the rest of your lives and I can show you that I can start off with, an, I can assume logistic growth, which we've seen a bunch of times today, but logistic equation, 
density dependence, plus environmental noise, and I can get a gamma distribution again. An entirely different set of mechanisms to get to the same model at the end. And that was kind of the story that I was hoping to tell, I'm getting the, the very truncated version of it, which is a really big cautionary tale in it's ecological modeling. And that's, and we've kind of seen a little bit of that. Not naming names, but I've even seen a bit of that in the way people have been talked about. We say, I saw this pattern, and this pattern implies this is what's happening. We do this all the time in sciences. We're especially bad about uh, this in ecology. We see a pattern, we assume a process. We see it, an entangled bank, we see there have to be a bunch of niches here to make that niche happen. I have just not shown you, but constructed multiple ways under entirely different mechanistic assumptions, the same pattern. Pattern does not imply process. And that is, I think, sort of probably the, the you know, sort of I was talking about being a zealot. This is my most important bit of zealotry. When you're doing your modeling, make sure that you are starting off with mechanistic assumptions rooted in biology that are measurable, ideally on individuals, because that's what we're usually measuring. And the reason is, is that we're doing science and doing science means falsification. And I can tell a bunch of different stories to get the same pattern using some really fancy mathematics to get there, but that's not gonna get me to what I really want, which is science, which is a testable hypothesis. Mechanistic modeling gives you exactly that. Each of these ways I got to Fisher's gamma, I made assumptions. I made assumptions that I can measure and test. What I'm also doing along the way, I had to skip over this, is building null models. Null models that sort of say that they sort of, I, I, I have this model that's sort of just like the, the simplest vanilla model. And if that vanilla model predicts what's happening, then I really have to do some work because I can't reject the possibility that, that forget Darwin's like, you know, that's just, you know, it's how foolish you think about chance. If I can't rule out pure chance, I don't have much of a result. And that's why sort of mechanistic theory and, and stochastic theory, I think is important because it gives us a way of building our hypotheses into testable models with summary statistics that we can then go out, measure, test, and falsify. And with that, thanks for your attention. And I'm just gonna stop there. Actually, uh, in, fact, in fact, I sort of, um, what I always wanted to do uh, when I was a postdoc many, many years ago was run an experimental system. Uh, unlike many of you, I have no one has ever had the confidence in my abilities as, an, as a scientist to let me anywhere near an experimental system. But one thing I like about microbial systems and why I first got interested in this and why I ended up here with you eight years ago is that microbial systems are awesome because we can actually do them in the laboratory and we can see stuff happening and we can measure it. And what always got interesting, for example, like the model system I've always loved is E. coli, right? It's about as simple, E. coli does what my mathematical models do. Like they move around, they give birth by dividing in two and sometimes they die or call it station of ice, call it death. That's, and you can put this under a microscope, you know, whether you want to do um, fluidic chemostats, honest to God chemostats, which are just a grand pain, or any other simple model systems, you can actually measure those births and deaths. Like you can, like my, my favorite systems, uh, Mark Goulian, for example, University of Pennsylvania was one of the first people to do this, but lots of people do, is they do microfluidics under a video microscope. And they can actually sit there and count the number of cell divisions. They can count which cells go into stationary phase and they can see when they did it. So basically what you've got now is an entirely empirical system, which is allowing you to, to calculate exactly B and D, measure it, and, and, and kind of like the rest of it just kind of runs from there. So like, that's like why I think, you know, if we, you know, probably, you know, sort of the kind of micro, 
microbial community ecology people are doing is actually probably one of the best places to start doing this kind of mechanistic modeling in ecology that I think is sort of like, is still in, very much in its infancy. Thanks for uh, your patience. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if anyone wants to hear a whole bunch of stuff about stochastic differential equations and Fokker-Planck equations, uh, I'm around here when I'm not hiding. And now I'm off to the pub. <laughs>